These are six insane stories about nuclear weapons and their history. This is the story of the only time in human history that a nuclear state had its nuclear keys activated and was fully prepared to launch a nuclear strike against an enemy. In 1983, the Soviet Union was in full alarm. Their nuclear early warning system had reported a nuclear strike incoming from the United States. The decision of whether or not to launch a retaliatory strike ultimately came upon a man named Stanislav Petrov, who violated Soviet protocol when he reported it as a false alarm. In doing so, Petrov might have prevented an all-out nuclear war between the US and the Soviet Union. But this was not the only time the world had a close call with nuclear war. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in early 1995, American and Norwegian scientists wanted to study the Northern Lights over Svalbard. To achieve this, they launched a Black Brandt 7 rocket carrying research equipment from northwestern Norway. The rocket flew over the same air corridor that a U.S. missile would fly if it launched from the Minuteman 3 nuclear missile silo in North Dakota towards Moscow. The scientists notified 30 countries, including Russia, of this experiment. Despite this, because Russian radar operators had not been notified, they saw this single missile as a potential high-altitude nuclear attack from the United States. This looked like the first stage in a surprise strike because such attacks generate EMPs that can blind Russian radar to other incoming missiles. The Black Brent 7 reached an altitude of 1,453 kilometers, or 903 miles, similar to that of a U.S. Trident missile. Russian nuclear forces were again put on high alert. The situation escalated even further to such a degree that the Russian nuclear briefcase, the Chaget, was brought to President Boris Yeltsin. He had 10 minutes to decide whether or not to launch a retaliatory strike against the United States. Yeltsin activated his nuclear keys during this time, the only known time any nuclear weapons state has done so in history. After waiting out eight minutes, it was determined that the rocket was not headed towards Moscow and a retaliatory strike was called off. After going through such a close call and understanding that it was notified of the experiment, Russia updated its notification and disclosure protocols to prevent such an event from happening again. This episode came to be called the Norwegian Rocket Incident. There have been a few well-known instances in which the world was on the brink of nuclear war, including the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Stanislav Petrov Incident. However, this lesser-known Norwegian Rocket Incident stands out as the only one in which a nuclear state had its nuclear keys activated and was fully prepared to launch a nuclear strike. Since the 1950s, when the Cold War was starting and both sides were experimenting wildly with their nuclear weapons, some nuclear powers have managed to lose a few nukes along the way. These losses usually happen as a result of an accident of some sort, accidents involving nuclear weapons like accidental detonation, theft, or misfiring are referred to as broken arrows. But let's focus specifically on the nukes that are lost unaccounted for, or missing. Some of you might think that the number of missing nukes is small, perhaps a few nuclear warheads missing thanks to an accident here or there, probably in the single digits, right? Well, in total, there are at least 40 nuclear warheads that are currently missing worldwide, and that's just those that the global powers acknowledge are missing. One of the first instances of this happening was in March 1956, when a U.S. Air Force B-47 bomber went missing during a routine mission from Florida to an overseas base. The plane carried two nuclear weapon cores, and it went missing somewhere over the Mediterranean Sea. The plane and its nuclear weapons were never heard from again. There was also the time in December 1965 when an A-4E Skyhawk light attack airplane fell off the aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga. The plane carried a one-megaton nuclear device that was never found. 
It took the U.S. Navy 15 years to admit that it had taken place at all. It happened near a Japanese island chain and caused a lot of controversy with the Japanese at the time who did not allow nuclear weapons in their territory. But perhaps the scariest and most controversial broken arrow was the sinking of the Soviet K-219 submarine. The submarine carried 32 nuclear warheads, and it sank 680 miles off the coast of Bermuda due to an explosion and fire in one of its missile tubes. Soviet authorities claimed this happened due to a collision with the USS Augusta submarine, though American authorities and the surviving K-219 Soviet commander deny that this ever happened. In total, this sinking caused the deaths of four crew members, including Sergei Premanin, who died shutting down the submarine's nuclear reactor. He was awarded the Order of the Red Star for his bravery at the time. Fortunately, most crew members were able to evacuate the sinking K-219. Now, what really sets this incident apart from the others is what happened after the remains of the submarine were found. A Soviet research ship managed to locate the remains of the K-219, which had been split into two by the water pressure. They took photographs of the wreckage. It turned out that the missile silo hatches were forced open, with tool marks visible, and all nuclear warheads were missing from the wreckage. Many believe that the K-219 did crash with the USS Augusta and that the United States got a hold of those nuclear warheads, but the US, of course, denies this. No country or organization has ever claimed responsibility for taking those 32 nuclear warheads. There are wild theories about what happened to them, but what makes this incident the most unnerving is that we'll likely never know. This single incident accounts for a majority of known missing nuclear weapons, but the other accidents were also numerous. Many of the missing nukes are probably rusting away somewhere on the seafloor, and many are probably no longer functional. However, with so many incidents like this having happened before, we can only wonder just how many were recovered, and by whom. We often think of nuclear bombs as extreme weapons of destruction. While they're certainly that, in the 1960s, the world's superpowers began investigating more practical uses for these powerful devices. The US and Soviet Union were embattled in the heat of the Cold War in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Both countries had stockpiled nuclear weapons, but thousands of them simply sat idly across their respective country. The US subsequently created Operation Plowshare, and the Soviet Union a program called Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy. Operation Plowshare in the U.S. was formed to explore the possibility of using nuclear explosions for excavation or natural gas fracturing. The evidence of this project's test can still be seen through craters in the Nevada desert. Surprisingly, this research project persisted for nearly 20 years, from 1958 to 1975. The Soviets were also researching practical uses for nuclear explosions, and like the U.S., their research was focused on natural gas and mining. Unlike the U.S., however, little concern was given to the environmental impact of these Soviet nuclear tests. Soviet engineers behind the project once contaminated a densely populated region along the River Volga. They also decided to blow up a river to create a reservoir, which they succeeded in doing, except it's still radioactive to this day. During this nuclear research, scientists realized that they might be able to solve a problem that had been raging for years. In 1963, a gas well in southern Uzbekistan suffered a blowout at a depth of 2.4 kilometers. The natural gas caught ablaze and for the next three years, it burned steadily. This unquenchable fire was causing the loss of more than 12 million cubic meters of gas each day. That's enough to supply the needs of many major cities and roughly the equivalent volume of 12 Empire State Buildings. No one in the country knew how to put the fires out, and all previous attempts had failed. It was at this point of desperation that dropping a nuclear bomb on the fires seemed like a pretty great idea to engineers and officials. Physicists calculated that if a nuclear bomb was detonated,
detonated close to the blowout region, the resulting pressure could shut any hole within 50 meters. Researchers ultimately calculated that the bomb needed to be 30 kilotons, or double the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. After confirming the calculations, officials decided that a nuclear explosion was the best way to stop the raging fire. In 1966, two wells were drilled sloping towards the blowout region determined to be at a depth of 1.4 kilometers needed to seal the holes. The 30 kiloton bomb was lowered into the most promising well, and then the well itself was backfilled with cement. Then, they detonated the bomb. There's no better way to understand what that day was like other than this account from the Soviet newspaper Pravda Vostika of Tashkent. On that cold autumn day in 1966, an underground tremor of unprecedented force shook the ground with a sparse grass cover on white sand. A dusty haze rose over the desert. The orange-colored torch of the blazing wells diminished, first slowly, then more rapidly, until it flickered and finally died out. For the first time in 1,064 days, quiet descended on the area. The jet-like roar of the gas well had finally been silenced. In 20 seconds, a three-year-long fire had been extinguished using a nuclear explosion, much to the satisfaction of Soviet engineers. The test was a success, but soon engineers were presented with another case to test their experiment again. A few months later, a fire broke out at the Pamik gas field, and the fire spread to the surface through various holes. Engineers and physicists determined that in order to stop this fire, they would need a stronger 47 kiloton bomb lowered to a deeper depth of 2.4 kilometers. The bomb was lowered into its well, backfilled with cement like before, and detonated. After a few days, the fire had stopped. It was after this second successful attempt at putting out large gas fires that the Soviets had found what they considered a highly practical use for nuclear explosions. They used nuclear bombs to stop a fire in May 1972 in the city of Mary and Asia. In July of that same year, they also used a nuclear explosion to stop a leaking well in Ukraine. The last known about attempt of this practice was in 1981 on a well on the northwestern coast of Russia. Of all of the explosions, the second at the Pamir gas field was the deepest and most powerful. And that's the story of how excess nuclear weapons, curious Soviet engineers, and rampant natural gas fires led to the underground detonation of massive nuclear bombs during the Cold War. Nuclear bombs are one of the most powerful and devastating weapons ever created. In seconds, they can wipe out entire cities and cause catastrophic destruction. But how do they work? The history of nuclear weapons dates back to the mid-1900s when scientists began to understand the process of nuclear fission. Fission occurs when a uranium or plutonium atom is split apart, releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the form of heat, light, and radiation. When these atoms are triggered in large numbers, it creates an atomic bomb. In 1939, scientists working in Berlin discovered that bombarding uranium with neutrons could produce a large amount of energy. This began what would soon become the world's most feared weapon. By 1945, the U.S. had successfully tested its first atomic bomb as part of the Manhattan Project on a desert range in New Mexico, thus entering in to the nuclear age. So, What's the actual specifics of how these bombs work? Well, these first nuclear bombs were powered by nuclear fission reactions, which release a tremendous amount of energy very quickly from very small amounts of matter. They have a long and complex history, but at their core, they're made up of two basic scientific components, fission and fusion. In an atom bomb, otherwise known as the first generation of nuclear weapons, the ones that were tested during the Manhattan Project, fissile materials such as uranium or plutonium are placed at the center of the bomb device. Around this core, there's chemical explosives that compress and detonate the fissile material, or the uranium and plutonium. This causes a chain reaction where neutrons split more atoms, leading to an incredible release of this atomic energy, 
that produces temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. This works by getting radioactive material up to something known as critical mass, or the minimum amount of material needed to sustain fission reactions. Little Boy, the first nuclear weapon that was ever used in wartime, worked by shooting a hollow uranium-235 cylinder at a target plug of the same material. Critical mass in this case was reached by firing the materials together, and this critical mass depends on the density of the material. As the density increases, the critical mass decreases. Fusion bombs, also known as hydrogen bombs or second generation nuclear bombs, are an even more powerful type of nuclear weapon. The process occurs when two isotopes of hydrogen, tritium and deuterium, are fused together in a confined space. This fusion releases far more energy than just fission alone. In fact, it can be thousands of times greater. For these modern thermonuclear weapons, rather than bringing two subcritical pieces of nuclear fuel together, modern weaponry instead detonates chemical explosives around a pit containing uranium-235 or plutonium metal. This inward force compresses its core and brings its atoms closer together until it reaches critical mass. Once this occurs, neutrons are injected to initiate a fission chain reaction, resulting in an atomic explosion with powerful devastation potential. Fusion is a much better bomb type than fission due to its efficiency in utilizing scarce materials like uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Thermonuclear weapons are generally articulated as primary, utilizing chemical and fission blast, and secondary, incorporating a consequential fusion detonation. Yet, the actual occurrences behind these explosions are far more intricate. For instance, a pure fission primary is inefficient, as the plutonium pit would explode before most of the plutonium-239 could react. To maximize the bomb's efficiency, a boosted reaction with hydrogen gas, composed of what we mentioned earlier, deuterium and tritium, at its core should be put in place to make this happen. As the surrounding plutonium responds to the sustained fission reaction, fusion occurs in tandem within the hydrogen gas, which then frees neutrons that further induce additional fissioning in the atoms. The secondary fuel doesn't solely contain fusion energy. It also has a fission spark plug made out of plutonium-239 or uranium-235. The initial explosion compresses the gas from the outside, which causes supercriticality in the spark plug material, thus heating and igniting more hydrogen fusion reactions. Fusion unleashes neutrons that then crash into a nearby layer of uranium, resulting in the fissioning of atoms and producing more than half of a weapon's explosive power. Thermonuclear weapons, as we previously referred to them, omit a uranium blanket, making them famously known as neutron bombs because of their fusion-driven emission of neutrons. These kind of bombs produce far more radiation than a regular atomic weapon with equal yield. During the Cold War period, these arms were contemplated for use against tank assaults with the aim to disabled tank officers without actually having to blow anything up. So how many nuclear weapons are out there and which countries have them? Estimates from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute suggest that there are roughly 13,400 nuclear weapons in existence across nine countries. There are five declared nuclear weapon states recognized by the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, which are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, which have a combined about 10,000 warheads between them. India, North Korea, Pakistan, and Israel are the other countries that are currently known to have nuclear weapons in their arsenal. So that's how nuclear weapons work, how many exist in the world, and what they could do if they all exploded. In the 1950s, at the beginning of the Cold War, an era marked by intense rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, the U.S. Air Force had a devious idea. If they detonated a nuclear weapon on the moon, it would not only be a victory in the space race, 
but also in the nuclear arms race. It would be a display of American excellence that would intimidate the Soviets and potentially give the United States an upper hand in the ongoing Cold War. If the plan had proceeded, the flash from the detonation would have been visible from Earth, creating a spectacle for everyone gazing at the night sky. The plan was to detonate the nuclear device on the moon's twilight zone, the region of the lunar surface between the illuminated and dark sides for maximum visibility. At the core of this plan, the US military believed that a nuclear explosion on the moon would have been a highly successful show of force, considerably embarrassing the Soviets on the international stage and boosting confidence in the US-led world order. The Air Force had a team of scientists evaluating the theoretical outcomes of the nuclear explosion, including Carl Sagan. Despite the theoretical feasibility, the project faced significant ethical and environmental concerns. Scientists questioned the wisdom of using the moon, a celestial body of great scientific interest and potential future exploration, as a testing ground for nuclear weapons. There were fears about contaminating the lunar environment and the unknown long-term effects of a nuclear explosion in space. But this was during a time that we had just developed nuclear weapons and were only beginning to understand them. Counterintuitively, blowing up a nuclear bomb on the moon posed no risk to humans. The nuclear bomb intended for the moon would have been just a small 1.7 kiloton device, several times smaller than the Hiroshima bomb. The explosion would have paled in comparison to other asteroid impacts the moon has endured likely leaving behind a crater invisible from Earth. Radioactivity would not have been a concern either, given that the moon is 238,900 miles away from Earth. Nevertheless, the plan never moved forward because the Air Force believed, at the time, that the potential dangers outweighed the benefits and determined that a lunar landing would have more significant appeal to the American and global public. Project A-119, as the plan was known, remained classified until the year 2000, after nearly 45 years of secrecy. The declassification only occurred after a formal Freedom of Information request was made about the project due to some leaked information. There is no hope that this experiment will be considered in the near future for anyone hoping to look at the sky and see a nuclear explosion. After nuclear superpowers recklessly experimented with their nuclear weapons in space in tests now referred to as high-altitude nuclear explosions, the practice of detonating nuclear devices in space was banned by the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 and the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. Nonetheless, one can't help but harbor a clandestine longing for a moonlit nuclear spectacle where the world watches in awe a carefully orchestrated, entirely safe, of course it is the US government after all, and utterly audacious explosion lighting up the lunar surface. Known now as the Goldsboro Incident, in the middle of the night on the 23rd of January 1961, a B-52 Stratofortress was flying over the skies of the Atlantic near the U.S. coast. The plane developed a fuel leak and was directed to fly towards Goldsboro, North Carolina, to land at nearby Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. However, as they had just crossed over land from the sea, the pilots lost control of the plane and had to bail out of the craft. Only five crew members successfully parachuted out, the rest died in the crash. This wasn't an ordinary flight for the B-52 and the crew, though, nor would it be an ordinary crash. On board the plane were two 3.8 megaton thermonuclear bombs. After the crew lost control of the plane and it began falling to the earth, it broke up and the two bombs separated from their attachments in the bays. They fell to the ground over North Carolina. At this point, you're probably thinking about that massive irradiated zone in North Carolina that no one's allowed to go to because those nuclear bombs exploded back in the day. Except that that doesn't exist, as you can probably guess, the bombs never detonated. 
The morning after the crash, investigators found that one of the bombs had successfully deployed its parachute and the other had fallen into a group of trees. The one that fell into the trees fell at such a high rate of speed, it was 18 feet under the surface of the earth when the crews found it. Luckily for everyone in North Carolina, the core of the weapons remained intact and there was no radiation leaking. The military at the time made sure to keep the public calm, but records now indicate that experts were rather concerned that one of the bombs would end up detonating due to accidental arming during the crash. This little tidbit of how close North Carolina came to being nuked wasn't really known until 2013 when author Eric Slosser acquired documents under the FIA, or the Freedom of Information Act. The documents detailed an alarming fact, that five out of the six total safety mechanisms the bomb had on board had become disarmed during the fall and crash. If the last one had unlocked, the bomb likely would have exploded. It was one 1960s-era dynamo low-voltage switch that kept the bomb from detonating. To give some perspective on how bad this would have been, the bombs that fell in Greensboro were 250 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The fireball from the bomb would have been 2 kilometers in diameter, and third-degree burns would have registered on human skin up to 19 kilometers away, not to mention the massive amount of radiation that would have leaked across the U.S. All of this said, there's some dispute to the claim that the bomb almost detonated by other researchers, believing that there were a few other safety mechanisms in place that would have kept the bomb from exploding. A debate can be had about the actual probability, but regardless, two nukes fell from the sky and dropped on North Carolina in 1961. The bomb that landed without a parachute actually broke up into several pieces, with one piece containing a significant amount of enriched uranium, which was never found. Between 1950 and 1968, the Goldsboro incident really wasn't that unique. There were 700 documented similarly significant nuclear accidents in that nearly 20-year span, with many arguably coming closer to detonation than Goldsboro. While now, in hindsight, we can recognize that the U.S. never accidentally nuked itself, it should be noted how many times the United States did come close to detonating thermonuclear weapons on their own citizens. Accidentally, of course. <laughs> 